This is a re-recording of a talk I gave on January 17, 2014 at the University of Virginia titled, Why Do We Overeat? A Neurobiological Perspective. Many of you may be familiar with this graph showing the prevalence of obesity in the United States over the last 50 years. In 1960, the prevalence of obesity was 13%, and by 2009, that had risen to 34%. Likewise, the prevalence of extreme obesity increased from 1 to 9%. This increased obesity prevalence is tightly correlated with an increase in calorie intake, as you can see in this green line. And when we quantify the increase, it comes out to 363 calories per day per person, more than we used to eat in 1960. The best available models indicate that this increase in calorie intake is more than sufficient to fully explain the U.S. obesity epidemic. So why are we eating more calories today than we used to, and why are we eating more calories than we need to to maintain leanness and health? Let's begin to answer this question by asking another question. How do you get a human to voluntarily overeat? One of the most interesting studies in this regard was published in 1992 by Eric Ravison's group. The goal of this study was to test a new food dispensing device that was designed to accurately measure food intake in humans. And what this was is basically a giant vending machine full of a variety of different types of foods, many of which were calorie dense and highly palatable. So subjects were placed in a research setting where they had access to these vending machines, free access to any of these foods for seven days. And what the researchers noted is that these people immediately began eating a much larger number of calories, exceeding their normal calorie requirements by over 50%, and over the course of seven days, gaining approximately five pounds of weight. So I find this result really remarkable because the obesity literature is full of overfeeding studies where researchers get people to overeat food so they can study the development and the consequences of obesity. But typically in these overfeeding studies, it's, it's really hard to get someone to overeat by a large number of calories. And so you have to provide them a pretty major incentive. So for example, you have to give them money or some of the studies, the, the quote volunteers were actually prisoners and they were offered the promise of parole. These are the types of incentives you normally have to offer people to overeat to this degree. But what I find so remarkable about this study is there was no incentive provided here. These people were not even asked to overeat, yet they spontaneously overate by more than 50% of their normal calorie intake and rapidly gained body weight and body fat. So I believe that if we can understand this result, we can go a long way toward understanding why we overeat in the modern US and in the modern world in general. Let's begin by reviewing the mechanisms of action selection by the brain. The brain is the central command station of the body, and essentially what it does is collect information from the internal environment, that is, what's going on inside the body, and collect information about the external environment, what's going on in your surroundings, and integrate those to select the appropriate internal response, that is physiological response, and the appropriate external response, that is behavioral response. Temperature regulation is an excellent example of this. In temperature regulation, the brain collects information from inside the body, including internal thermometers in the visceral cavity and the brain, and body energy status, and it also collects information about the external environment through thermometers in the skin. So that tells it about future threats to the internal environment. It integrates that information and uses it to determine both the physiological responses of vasoconstriction, that is uh, blood vessel constriction or dilation, non-shivering thermogenesis and shivering, as well as the behavioral responses of heat seeking, clothing, and posture. And all of these responses are designed to maintain a stable internal environment of 98 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit. The brain regulates feeding in a similar manner. 
So it collects information about the internal energy status of the body and what's going on in the external environment, and it integrates those to determine the appropriate physiological response in terms of digestion and metabolism, as well as the appropriate behavioral response in terms of eating. So what we're primarily concerned with in this talk is how the brain uses internal energy status and the external environment to determine eating behavior. At any given moment, the brain can initiate an almost infinite number of possible behaviors. So how does it select which one to initiate that's appropriate for the situation? This selection process is associated with a group of structures in the brain called the basal ganglia. And these are extremely deeply conserved all the way down to hagfish, which are some of the most primitive vertebrates known, indicating that these structures evolved more than 500 million years ago and are common to nearly all vertebrates. The basic way that these are thought to work is the basal ganglia receives sort of action bids from the cerebral cortex for possible actions to be executed. Among these actions, the basal ganglia selects the one that's most appropriate for a given situation and passes that on to motor systems that directly control the muscular contraction that leads to behavior. To decide which action the basal ganglia are going to select, they receive information about the internal state of the body and the external environment from other brain regions. So where is this information coming from? One of the main sources of this information is the dopamine producing parts of the brain, the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra, which project to the basal ganglia and other parts of the brain involved in action selection. The importance of dopamine in action selection is well illustrated by the dopamine deficient mouse, which was generated by Richard Palmiter's group at the University of Washington. These mice are totally unable to execute motivated goal oriented behaviors. Now they're still able to move normally because when they're startled they can jump or when they're placed in water they can swim. However, the pattern that they take when they're swimming is not the same as a normal mouse. They swim in a random, non-goal oriented way as opposed to a normal mouse which tends to swim around the edges of the bucket to try to get out. Illustrating that these animals lack key information that allows their action selection system to match behavioral responses to prevailing environmental conditions. These animals will not eat or drink unless dopamine is chemically replaced, which it must be every day or else they starve. These animals cannot select or motivate behaviors showing that dopamine is a key element of the action selection process. Dopamine also plays a key role in behavioral reinforcement, which in the case of food is called food reward. The way this works is that when you eat a food that has desirable physical characteristics such as a high calorie density and lots of sugar, fat, and starch, the brain is informed of this by the digestive system. And at the same time, the brain receives sensory information about that food such as its smell, appearance, taste, texture, and location. Over time, as you repeatedly consume that food, the brain comes to associate those sensory qualities with the digestive consequences of the food. And if those consequences are good, in other words, if that food is delivering lots of calories, lots of sugar, fat, and starch, over time, the sensory qualities that are associated with it will become more appealing. This is a straightforward example of classical or Pavlovian conditioning. Similarly to how Pavlov's dogs learned to salivate at the sound of a bell that had been repeatedly paired with food, humans learn to be motivated and perhaps even to salivate at the exposure to sensory qualities that predict foods that they've enjoyed in the past. So the next time you encounter sensory information that predicts this desirable food, you'll be highly motivated to obtain and eat it. So what food properties cause this to happen? Humans have a set of innately preferred food properties that are common to all cultures. And these include calorie density, fat, sugar, starch, salt, free glutamate, which is that meaty umami flavor and an absence of bitterness. In addition, we have a set of learned preferences 
that are any sensory property that's been repeatedly associated with innately preferred properties. And these are the things that differ across cultures. Now, if you look at this list of innate preferences, there's a pattern that emerges. These are all qualities that predict high calorie, low toxicity foods in a natural environment, suggesting that food reward evolved to guide us to calorie dense, non-toxic food in a scarce ancestral environment. So imagine yourself as a, imagine yourself as a hunter gatherer on the African savanna. Are you gonna spend all afternoon and spend hundreds of calories trying to ga gather 100 calories worth of broccoli or are you going to spend that same amount of time trying to gather calorie dense food that's providing more calories than you're expending? Obviously the latter. Food reward guides us and motivates us to obtain calorie dense food that would have helped us survive in an ancestral environment that we no longer live in. So even though a hunter gatherer would never have been exposed to pizza, Pizza would have been an incredible score for a hunter-gatherer because it delivers so much energy. And correspondingly, our food reward system responds very strongly to that type of food. So let's start to put all this together into a model of human eating behavior. At the bottom, we have the motor systems that are driving the muscle contractions that are putting food into your mouth. Above that, we have the action selection system that's controlling the motor systems. Above that, we have the reward system that's providing input into the action selection system. And above that, we have all the other systems that are providing input into the reward and action selection system. And now we're going to get into these in greater detail later, but what I want to point out for the time being is that they can be divided into two broad categories. Those that provide information about the internal energy status of the body and those that provide information about the external environment. When you eat due to signals from your internal energy status, you're typically meeting your body's energy needs and that process usually involves hunger. This is called homeostatic eating. In contrast, when you eat for reasons related to the external environment that have nothing to do with energy needs and nothing to do with hunger, that's called non-homeostatic eating. Key points from this section are that the brain generates all behaviors, including eating. The brain decides to eat based on a variety of internal and external factors. Food preferences favor calorie density and low toxicity. Homeostatic eating is eating due to an energy need and is typically associated with hunger, whereas non-homeostatic eating is eating for reasons other than energy need and reasons other than hunger. Let's take a closer look at homeostatic eating. The satiety system regulates food intake on a meal to meal basis. The way this works is that when you eat, food first enters your stomach and stretches it, and that stretch information is relayed to the brain. Similarly, as food travels down the small intestine, the small intestine sends information about both the quantity and quality of that food to the brain. This information is integrated in a part of the brain called the brainstem, gradually leading to a building sensation of satiety or fullness. When this builds to a sufficient degree, you lose interest in food. Now it's very important to note that satiety does not correspond exactly to the calorie value of food. For example, protein provides more satiety per unit calorie than fat or carbohydrate. Also, food that's more calorie dense, in other words, has a smaller volume per unit calorie, provides less satiety or fullness per unit calorie consumed. Food with a higher fiber content provides more satiety per calorie. And finally, although palatability is not a physical characteristic of food, the more palatable a food is, the more of it you have to eat to achieve satiety. This has very important implications for calorie intake and overeating, because if you wanna sit down and overeat at a meal without even realizing you're overeating, it's very easy to do. All you have to do is consume food that has a low satiety value per calorie. In other words, you eat food that has a high calorie density, high palatability, and doesn't contain much protein or fiber. 
And as you might imagine, this describes many of the foods that we intuitively recognize as fattening. The energy homeostasis system regulates the energy content of the body over long periods of time by directly regulating the size of fat stores. The way this works is that body fat secretes a hormone called leptin in proportion to its size. Leptin travels through the circulation and activates a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. In turn, the hypothalamus controls factors that affect the size of fat stores such as food intake and energy expenditure. So the way this works is that if you were to try to lose weight, your fat stores will decline and at the same time your circulating leptin will go down. Your hypothalamus will detect this decline in leptin and will activate a program designed to increase food intake, decrease energy expenditure, and restore the lost fat. Once that lost fat is restored, your leptin goes back up and your food intake and energy expenditure normalize. Now it's important to note that this process can work in both directions. So it protects both against fat loss and against fat gain. But this raises an important question. If we have a system that is designed to prevent fat gain as well as fat loss, how could we possibly have an obesity epidemic? Well, currently what we believe is happening is that the brain actually loses sensitivity to this leptin signal. So what happens in this scenario is that fat mass is increased and leptin is increased, but since the brain has a lower sensitivity to leptin, it perceives this as normal. So it's defending this situation against changes. It's defending that fat mass against upward or downward shifts and defending this steady state of higher fat mass, higher leptin, and higher food intake. To illustrate this principle, let's review some research from Rudy Leibel's group. What they've shown, among many others, is that when you control for physical activity, there's a good correspondence between total energy expenditure, in other words, the total amount of energy a person uses per day, and that person's lean mass. And this doesn't matter whether you're obese or lean, the same relation holds true. In other words, you'll fall on the same line. However, when you cause someone to lose weight, no matter whether they're lean or obese, they will actually fall off this line. So in other words, their energy expenditure per unit lean mass goes down. This happens whether you're obese or lean. And this is associated with the whole suite of other adaptations, including increased hunger, increased interest in food, increased muscular efficiency, which means your calories burned per contraction goes down, and decreased thyroid hormone activity. And this is a suite of adaptations that is initiated by the brain for the purposes of restoring that lost fat. But his research actually went further. What they did then was they replaced these people's leptin to the pre-weight loss level. So they just brought their low leptin level back up to the level it was prior to weight loss. And what they found was that remarkably, this actually greatly attenuated this suite of adaptations, including the reduction in energy expenditure per unit lean mass. So this shows that both lean and obese people actively defend their current level of fat mass and that this process involves leptin. So how does a lean brain go? How does a lean brain become an obese brain? And how does a leptin sensitive brain become a leptin resistant brain? One of the things that's been consistently noted in experimental models of obesity is that leptin resistance in the hypothalamus is associated with this inflammatory response there. And this inflammatory response in turn is associated with the activation of cell types in the brain such as microglia and astrocytes. And I'm going to show you a little bit of data from our lab that show that these are indeed activated in the brains of obese animals. So let's have a look at some images from our lab, which is the lab of Mike Schwartz at the University of Washington. What you're looking at here is a section of brain from a lean rat showing a part of the hypothalamus called the arcuate nucleus that's very important for regulating body fatness. What we have stained in green is a cell type called microglia. This is the resident immune cell population in the brain. 
and you can see that these cells are very small with small discrete cell bodies and very fine cellular processes. Now this is an image from an animal that's been fed a fattening diet for seven days. And what you can see is that already after only seven days, these cells are larger and the cellular processes are thicker, indicating an activation of this immune cell type that's associated with this inflammatory response. So now let's add on top of that a different kind of stain that labels astrocytes, which are another cell type that responds to inflammation and injury in the brain. And you can see that they're labeled in red here. So normally, as on the left, these are very small cells with long, fine cellular processes. However, you can see that in the brain of an animal that's been fed a fattening diet for only seven days, these cells become larger and the processes become much more numerous. So this is indicative, again, of an inflammatory process occurring in the hypothalamus. And similarly to how inflammation can suppress insulin signaling in other tissues like the liver and muscle tissue, inflammation can suppress leptin signaling in the brain. So this is one of the things that we think is happening that's causing the brain to lose sensitivity to leptin. Well, animals are fascinating to study, but ultimately what we're really interested in is humans. So we actually went further than this animal research and we looked to see if we could see any of these responses happening in the brains of obese humans. So we did MRIs, which is a non-invasive technique for looking at brain structure in lean and obese people. And we compared the density of a part of the hypothalamus to a control region called the amygdala. And now we know that when uh, this cell population astrocytes are strongly activated from things like stroke or traumatic brain injury, they change the density of the MRI signal. And so we reasoned that maybe this astrocyte activation, this lower level of activation that we were seeing in these experimental animals could be detected in the brain of a live human. And so that's exactly what we looked for. And on this slide, you can see MRI, and MRI images from on the left, a lean person, and on the right, an obese person. And you don't have to bother squinting at these images. You're not gonna be able to see anything by eye because the differences are very subtle and we have to extract them using uh, uh, special analysis. However, when we do that, what we find is that actually this signal does increase with increasing body mass index, which is a measure of body fatness. So we are finding evidence that this process may be occurring in the human brain as well. And this uh, is going to require a lot of future research, but uh, so far the evidence is promising in this direction. To sum up the last few slides, obese people have altered brain function causing them to defend a higher fat mass. This is related to reduced leptin sensitivity and the mechanism of this may involve an injury response in the hypothalamus. So let's begin to flesh out this model that I introduced earlier in the talk. At the bottom we have our motor systems, above that action selection and reward. And now we fleshed out the energy homeostasis system and the satiety system. Around those, I've placed some of the factors that we discussed that influence those systems and how they plug in to reward and action selection. So the key points from this section are that food intake and body fatness are regulated to maintain energy stability. Energy regulation systems are key inputs to action selection and obese people have altered energy regulation systems that favor a higher food intake. Let's move on to non-homeostatic eating. To review, non-homeostatic eating is eating for reasons other than hunger and other than energy need. To illustrate the importance of this principle, let's do a little thought experiment. Imagine you're in your favorite restaurant and you've just finished a large meal. You're totally stuffed you don't want any more food, and the waiter brings out a plate and puts it in front of you 
and it's a brownie. It was just baked and the smell is wafting up to your nose and there's a big ball of ice cream right beside it or whatever your favorite dessert is. Now what's the likelihood with this right in front of you that you're going to eat it despite being totally full after this big meal? If you're like most people, the likelihood is quite high. If you're like me, the likelihood is high. Now imagine a different scenario. Instead of a brownie, the waiter brings out a plate of plain boiled potatoes. Nothing on them, no salt, no sauce, nothing. Just plain boiled potatoes, but the exact same number of calories as the brownies. Now what's the likelihood that you're gonna eat those potatoes after a large meal? Now if you're like most people, you're not gonna to touch the potatoes. So this illustrates that there are many reasons that we eat that are totally independent of hunger. And as you might imagine, food palatability or the pleasure value of food is one of the most influential factors. John DeCastro's research group quantified this by measuring people's food intake and their self-rated palatability of each meal on a scale of one to seven. And what he showed is that compared to a palatability rating of one to three, which is a low palatability, a palatability rating of seven was associated with a 44% higher calorie intake. That's 219 calories per meal. One thing I wanna point out is that calorie intake didn't really start to increase substantially until the highest palatability ratings of six and seven. Another very important variable that's emerged is food variety. So this is some research conducted by Barbara Rolls and colleague in mice. What they did was they took mice and they divided them into five different groups. One group got standard healthy rodent fare. Another three groups each got one type of junk food, so either salami or chocolate or cookies. And then a fourth group got all of those junk foods at the same time. And then they looked at these animals' body weight over time. And what they found is that the animals fed a single type of junk food were heavier than the animals fed only the standard healthy chow. However, the animals that were fed a variety of junk food were much heavier than any of the other groups. And this has been replicated in humans as well. The more variety there is on the table, the more total calories we're likely to eat. Another thing that's very important is the effort and resource cost of food. In other words, how much money does it cost and how much effort does it take to eat it? So let's do another thought experiment to illustrate this. Imagine that you're sitting at your desk and there's a plate of brownies next to you all day. Or if you don't like brownies, something else that you really, really like. It's sitting there staring at you all day. Now what's the likelihood that you're gonna grab one of those brownies and eat them and eat it at some point during the day? Probably pretty high if you're like most people. Now let's imagine a different scenario. Same brownies, but they're across the street in a coffee shop and they cost $6 a brownie. Now what's the likelihood that you're gonna go eat those brownies? Probably pretty low. So like most people, the effort and resource cost of a food has a big impact both on your food selection and on your total intake. Another important factor that John DeCastro's group identified is the social environment. So compared to eating alone, eating with six other people is associated with a 72% higher calorie intake, that's 310 calories per meal. And similarly, we eat more calories on the weekends than we do on weekdays, about 8% more. Stress and boredom are another important factor in food intake. The American Psychological Association reported that 43% of U.S. adults overeat when they're stressed. However, this is very individual because they also reported that 36% of adults actually skip meals when they're stressed. However, one thing that's really interesting about this is that whether you overeat or you skip meals, most people tend to gravitate toward calorie-dense, refined, comfort food, and alcohol. Speaking of alcohol, alcohol itself is an important driver of non-homeostatic eating. Alcohol is rich in calories and it's usually consumed for pleasure, not because we're hungry or we need energy, 
In addition, it increases hunger, increases food intake, and facilitates poor food choices such as eating a whole plate of nachos at 2 a.m. Insufficient or poor quality sleep is also emerging as an important driver of non-homeostatic eating. When you don't get enough sleep or you don't sleep well enough, it tends to reduce your willpower to make constructive decisions, facilitates poor food choices, and alters hormones related to hunger and metabolism in a direction that favors increased food intake and increased fat storage. Habits are another key determinant of what we eat and how much we eat. For example, a person might not be that hungry, but he might eat anyway simply because it's lunchtime or it's snack time, or he might have a soda with lunch just because that's what he always has with lunch. And to illustrate the importance of this principle, I'm going to describe a study that was done in amnesic patients. So these are people with no short-term memory whatsoever. These people were being kept in a hospitalized setting, and on the day of the experiment, researchers brought in their normal lunch and announced it's lunchtime. These people completely consumed the lunch, researchers took the trays back out, and 15 minutes later, they came back in with a second lunch and once again announced it's lunchtime. The patients completely consumed this second lunch, the researchers took the trays back out, and then 15 minutes later they came back in with a third lunch and once again announced it's lunchtime. And this time the, people, the patients only ate a small amount of the food, they only picked at it. So eventually, satiety kicked in and prevented them from eating additional food. But that didn't happen until after these patients had consumed more than twice their normal calorie intake at lunch, all simply because they thought it was lunchtime. So let's flesh out the non-homeostatic side of this model of food intake behavior. We have the motor systems, action selection, and reward. On top of that, we have the hedonic system, which regulates pleasure. And we have this kind of catch-all category of cognition and emotions that represents a variety of different brain regions. And around that, we have some of the factors that we've discussed that influence those. One very important point I wanna make about non-homeostatic eating is that it's typically overeating. Since hunger usually signals an energy need and non-homeostatic eating is eating in the absence of hunger and in the absence of an energy need, non-homeostatic eating usually means you're consuming unneeded excess calories, and that typically causes the gain of unneeded excess fat. So let's illustrate the importance of this principle using a study on holiday weight gain in the United States. So in this particular study, the average U.S. adult gained about 0.6 kilos per year. However, over the course of the six-week holiday period, people in the same sample gained 0.3 kilos, showing that 52% of annual weight gain in the United States occurs over only 12% of the year, corresponding to the six week holiday season. So why is this? Well, holiday overeating is characterized by food with a high palatability and calorie density. There's a great variety of food that's readily accessible People typically drink more alcohol than usual. There are social factors promoting food intake, and there's habit. We're used to eating a lot of food on Thanksgiving. So holiday overeating and weight gain is an excellent example of non-homeostatic overeating leading to significant weight gain in the US population. The key points from this section are that many non-homeostatic factors influence action selection Another way of saying this is that we eat for many reasons other than hunger, and non-homeostatic eating usually means consuming excess calories and gaining fat. Now let's review some U.S. diet history to see if it can shed some light on why we're overeating today. This may be the most important graph in the entire talk. What we have on the horizontal axis is years from 1889 to 2009 and on the vertical axis, we have the percent of total food spending dedicated to food consumed at home, away from home, and away from home as fast food. In 1889, 93% of all food spending was on food to be consumed in the home, whereas in 2009, that had dropped to only 
And I think this graph actually underestimates the magnitude of the change because in 2009, a lot of the food that was being consumed in the home was actually commercially prepared food. And if we look at the trends in fast food, we can see that between 1960 and 2009, the proportion of food spending uh, dedicated to fast food increased from 2% to 18%. So this illustrates a very profound shift in US food culture away from home prepared food and toward commercially prepared food. And as you might imagine, this has corresponded to a, a massive expansion of commercially prepared food in the marketplace. So if you're a food manufacturer, how do you sell food? How do you get people to buy your food and how do you compete against other companies that are also trying to sell people food? Well, you might recognize some of these strategies. First, you create a product that appeals to both innate and learned food preferences. You give it a high calorie density, you add fat, sugar, and starch to it. You add salt, glutamate, and other flavors to make it appealing. You make it extremely convenient both to purchase and consume. You make it as cheap as possible. You offer it in great variety. You expose people to food cues, for example, through advertising. And you make your food seem healthy, fun, or popular. And as we're gonna see, all of these things have been increasingly occurring in the US food marketplace. For example, the consumption of added fats in the United States has more than doubled over the last century. And if we break this down by animal versus vegetable fat, what we see is that the increase has come exclusively from an increase in vegetable fats. And this represents cheap refined seed oils being added to processed foods to make them more appealing. Adding sugar to food is an outstanding way to get people to buy it. This graph shows data that my research partner Jeremy Landon and I compiled showing added sugar intake between 1822 and 2006 in the United States. What you can see is there's been a huge increase over that time period. In 1822, the average American consumed the amount of sugar in one 12 ounce can of cola every five days, whereas today, that same amount of sugar is consumed every seven hours. And this has been facilitated by a number of changes in um, technology, such as the popularization of granulated sugar, the development of glass blowing machines around the turn of the century, the development of refrigerated vending machines in the 1920s, and finally, the development of high fructose corn syrup in the 1970s, which allowed large amounts of sugar to be added to our food for virtually no cost. Another great way to sell food is to add palatable flavorings to it. And to illustrate this, I'm gonna walk you through the ingredients list for a Burger King strawberry milkshake. So this is the base shake mix here. It's mostly dairy and sugar with some mystery ingredients in there. And to that, they add the strawberry shake syrup that gives it the color and characteristic flavor. And this is mostly sugar and flavorings. But what is this here, artificial flavor? Well, the FDA doesn't require these companies to disclose the actual ingredients for their artificial flavors. However, what I'm gonna show you is a typical ingredients list for artificial strawberry flavor. It looks something like this. I had to shrink the font to get it all on the slide. Now, I have a BS in biochemistry and I can look at this list and not recognize a lot of these ingredients. So that's kind of scary, but it's actually beside the point. The main point here is that this is a highly engineered food. This food has been professionally engineered to maximize appeal while minimizing cost. Convenience foods have also become a lot more popular. We used to eat breakfast, but now we have Pop-Tarts. We used to send the kids off to school with lunch, but now we have Lunchables. The cost of food has also plummeted dramatically in the United States over the last 80 years, as you can see in this graph, showing that the percent of disposable income spent on food declined from 25 to 10% over that time period. Another effective way to sell food is to offer it in great variety. 
In 1980, the average U.S. supermarket offered 15,000 different food products, which is already an incredible number. But by 2012, that had increased to an astronomical 43,000. Food cues such as these are used in advertising to get us to purchase food. As a matter of fact, I'd be willing to bet that right now, a significant portion of the people watching this are more likely to crave and purchase cola than they were about 30 seconds ago. Another strategy that's commonly used by food manufacturers is to portray their food as healthy. So these are two of the more egregious examples that I dug up from the 1960s and 1970s that were paid for by the sugar industry. Essentially, what they're claiming is that sugar-rich foods like ice cream and candy bars can be an effective weight loss aid because if you consume them before a meal, they'll suppress your appetite for the meal. The logic here is impeccable. The key points from this section are that U.S. food habits have evolved considerably over the last century. Manufacturers have successfully catered to our natural food preferences, and these natural food preferences are precisely those that favor increased food intake. So let's put this all together. So here's our complete simplified model of food intake. We've got the motor systems, action selection, reward. We've got the systems that are plugging into that. And then we've got all the factors that are influencing those systems. Now this model is obviously highly simplified, but it's sufficient to illustrate the key points in this talk. Now, there are a lot of factors here. How does the brain take all these factors and tie them together into a single decision of whether or not to eat. I like to conceptualize this as a sort of seesaw model where on one side we have factors that are promoting eating and on the other side we have factors that are opposing eating and the relative weight of each side is what determines whether or not you're actually gonna engage in eating behavior. So in an ancestral environment, similar to the one that our brains actually evolved in on the side promoting eating, primarily we have hunger. On the side opposing eating, we have highly satiating foods, we have food with a very high effort and resource cost, and we have aversive properties, things like bitterness or off flavors or decay. Now, the situation is very different in the modern food environment. We have a lot more factors, as we've discussed, that are promoting eating. So food is highly rewarding and palatable today relative to how it would have been in a hunter-gatherer environment. Food has a higher calorie density. We have access to drugs like alcohol. Food is entertainment. And then on the side opposing eating, we have a lot, really a lot less going on there. Um, food is less satiating. The effort and resource cost of it is extremely low. And the aversive properties are almost non-existent. You can go to a grocery store and buy whatever food you want that you prefer. You don't have to eat something that's potentially bitter or partially decayed, etc. Really, the only thing we have on the side opposing eating today, the only major factor we have is cognitive restraint. In other words, using willpower to tell yourself not to eat these foods that are right in front of you that these other factors are trying to tell you to eat. Unfortunately, that's a limited resource for most people and it can only go so far. So our neurobiological hardware is the same as it's always been, but our environment today is very different. So let's come back to this study that we discussed at the beginning of the talk. Why is it that these volunteers greatly overate and gained weight and fat at a rapid rate when they were placed in this research setting? Well, they were in an environment where they were exposed to highly palatable calorie-dense food in a wide variety. They were low satiety foods. There was essentially zero effort and resource cost associated with these foods. They were freely available at no cost. And they were sitting around a laboratory setting with nothing better to do than eat. They were bored. The reason I think this study is so important is because I believe it's an exaggerated microcosm of the same changes that have occurred in the United States during the course of the development of the obesity epidemic. 
So why do we overeat? Our neurobiological hardware is primarily concerned with ensuring calorie sufficiency, not protecting against calorie excess. And these mechanisms are extremely rational in a scarce natural environment, such as the one in which we evolved. Technological progress has effectively catered to our hardwired dietary preferences, and some people would say it's catered to it too effectively. Many aspects of the modern food and lifestyle environment converge to increase the likelihood of eating. And once obesity is established, overeating becomes a self-sustaining state. I'd like to give a heartfelt thanks to everyone who was involved in generating data that I included in this talk, including my former mentor, Mike Schwartz, my collaborator, Josh Thaler, who was the primary author on the data from our lab that I shared, my colleague, Catherine Burkseth, my research partner, Jeremy Landon, and all of the other researchers whose efforts have made this talk possible. If you're interested in seeing more of my work, you can check out my website at www.wholehealthsource.org. Thanks for watching.